This is a video abstract to talk about uh, what's called a dynamic mode decomposition for a multi-resolution analysis. This is joint work with Steve Brunton at the University of Washington and graduate student Xing Fu, who uh, finished his PhD last year in applied math here at University of Washington. Uh, as the name implies, what we're going to try to do is do a multi-resolution analysis using this new tool called dynamic mode decomposition. And I want to highlight what some of the features are of this and some of the background history of this. The dynamic mode decomposition uh, really came out of pioneering work from Igor Mezich in 2004-2005 on uh, bringing together the ideas of a Koopman operator and relating it to nonlinear dynamical systems. In fact, a, a good reference for that is here in 2005, where there's this work on the idea of Koopman uh, in, a, in a deep theoretical work. And what this shows is sort of both uh, theory and algorithm development versus the dynamic mode decomposition in its relationship to Koopman. And this is uh, from uh, Jonathan Tu, courtesy of Jonathan Tu at Berkeley. Um, in the intervening years from 2005, there were three key papers, uh, Schmidt uh, in 2010 and Schmidt and Sesterhan in 2008, which really introduced the dynamic mode decomposition algorithm. Uh, as well as this paper by Rowley and Message et al. in the journal Fluid Dynamics, uh, Fluid Mechanics, which introduced this idea of, of the decomposition. And the basic idea is kind of simple, which is to take correlated spatial temporal activity and pin them together. So the idea is uh, to use the power of something like POD analysis, which looks at correlated activity, but now to pin that activity spatially to certain time modes, in particular Fourier modes in time over a sampling window. Uh, most recent incarnation of this here is in uh, Jonathan Tu's paper in 2014 in the journal Computational Dynamics, which actually formally defines the DMD uh, in, a, in a more general way and it is a nice piece of work to follow up on this. There's a lot of other uh, methods here. Uh, Williams, who has also developed some of the ideas of Koopman and al algorithms and applications. Uh, and these are just a, a sampling of some of the theoretical developments along this line of the dynamic mode decomposition. So let's talk about, from a higher level, what the dynamic mode decomposition is. And we start off with a uh, perspective of dynamical systems. In particular, think about some kind of nonlinear time-dependent system given by here, uh, which normally what we think about is we specify some nonlinear function n. Okay? We give some initial data, and then we can just simulate this and solve forward in time. But one of the th interesting things about a lot of complex systems nowadays, or nonlinear dynamical systems, is we don't necessarily know n. And so we might start the other way, which is we have some measurements of the system. It's called these g that can happen in different spatial and temporal locations. And you can start seeing that this looks like a data simulation framework, where you have measurements, initial condition, dynamical system. In a traditional way, what we would do in a dynamical systems course is start here and do analysis in this direction. So we might do some analysis, make some predictions, compare it to some measurements. And now the idea is that, suppose I don't know this n, so I don't know what the nonlinear dynamical system is, but I have a lot of data measurements. Can I go from g? And measurements and some initial state of the system and come back this way. So maybe I can infer the correct n from the dynamical measurements themselves. So that is some of the ideas behind dynamic mode decomposition. In particular, what it really is, is considering the construction of some linear dynamical system directly from the data. So it's like an equation-free way to pull out the best fit linear dynamical systems to the data. Okay, so it's like a regression task. Uh, the nice thing about this formulation of the, uh, of the dynamical system is that we can write down exact eigenfunction expansion solutions, for instance, to the system. And we can say a lot about stability, growth modes, or oscillatory modes, and this is the structure under which we can write this. Okay? What the dynamic mode decomposition does is it takes this approximate dynamical system, x tilde, and basically gives you the best fit linear dynamical system to your data. So you have your actual data, x of t, you have your linear dynamical system, x tilde, and you want this distance to be minimized in an L2 sense, and that's what the dynamic mode decomposition does. 
So that's sort of the, the abstraction in some level. It's reconstructing dynamical systems from data. Okay? But here, we're limited to constructing linear dynamical systems. And there's a lot of effort to try to figure out how can we get away from this and maybe even construct nonlinear dynamical systems from data. So let me try to motivate what we want to do is we, within this context, there's a very nice way to start thinking about uh, this solution structure in particular. What is the interpretation of these omegas that sit over here? Uh, and I want to start with a very simple example from video processing to think about video frames as a dynamical system. And in particular, look at when omega is near zero. If there is an eigenvalue, which is omega near zero, what it corresponds to is e to the zero t, which is one, which means some mode that is not changing in time. And this is our background mode of a video. So let me just show you this, how we might do this. We could take snapshots of a video frame at certain points in time. So we collect all this uh, video frames from M snapshots of the video. And typically, a camera like your iPhone might take 30 frames per second. So we, can, we decide how many frames we want to take in there. And this is the idea of Koopman in the 1930s, which is, can I construct a matrix A that takes me from one frame to the next? But that's not really what you want to do. You want a matrix A that takes you from one frame to the next and then to the next, and then to the next. So essentially, if you start thinking about collecting all your data frames from J to K, what you want to do is construct the best fit matrix A that advances all the video frames, one delta T, into the future. That is the mapping we are looking to construct. And construct this A in a least square fit form. Okay? So that is the way this DMD algorithm works. And in fact, this is what was uh, essentially proposed by Schmidt in 2010. And since then, it's been modified by two in this work here to uh, a couple modifications to make what's called exact DMD. And so the idea is the following. Here's the algorithm. You start off with your data collection. This is from frame 1 to m minus 1. And you perform an SVD. Here's the SVD decomposition. And right away in this step, one can see that you can start taking advantage of dimensionality reduction. In particular, you might find that if, as you do this step here, you might find some low rank space that is actually ideal for capturing the dynamics, and you can do a low rank truncation right here at this step. <coughs> and whenever possible, in fact, that's exactly what you'd want to do. Once you have this decomposition, you construct out of this decomposition uh, a matrix A tilde, which is a similarity matrix to, to this uh, data matrix. Uh, and here is the construction of this matrix. I won't go too much into the details. They're outlined in Schmidt as well as this paper. Uh, and then through this companion matrix A, you look at its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And from that, you can compute the DMD modes. And ultimately, from those eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you can construct the DMD solution, which is given by here, which is some, some coefficients, which are basically determined by the initial conditions, some modal structures, which are given by here, and the time dynamics. So this here looks like the linear solution to that differential equation x tilde that I showed at the beginning. So this is the algorithm proposed by Schmidt, or very close to it. And this is what we want to use for this decomposition framework. Now, what I did mention is this video subtraction problem, where I can start looking at this solution, the DMD solution, as being constructed of two pieces. First, one piece here, where omega p, I look at the omega p where the absolute value is near zero. In other words, I'm looking for the stationary modes of this thing. So if omega p is near zero or is zero, then this thing here just is a constant solution. And here's everything else. Now, in a video context, once I do this decomposition and I pull out the zero mode and everything else, the zero mode is, in fact, the background of the video, and the rest is the foreground of the video. Let me show you this in application. And this is work with Jake Grosick and myself. And what we did is foreground background subtraction. And here's a couple different examples. This is the original video at time frames in the video frame 500, 1000, and 2000. And this is a video of a street scene in London. And it came from a parked, uh, from a surveillance challenge video set. 
And what you see is that there's cars driving down the road, and then you have this structure, and you would like to identify cars. Pedestrians are also present in the, in the frames. And you'd like to just be able to extract the moving objects from the background objects. And we compare this with one other method, which is the robust principal component decomposition, which is given by here. And this is the robust principal components. This is the foreground object, which is also called sparse object. And the low rank background, which is uh, the, just the background image. And this is our DMD separation. These are the uh, moving objects. And here is the background, which is the omega p near 0. And what you can see is the method is quite competitive with other methods, like the robust principal components. It pulls out the foreground objects. Here's three cars moving. Here is a car here. There's a pedestrian walking across the street. And then later in the frames, four cars here. <coughs> so this is how you would do this decomposition of a video frame for, for a surveillance example. <coughs> how does it compare time-wise? Well, if we compare something like the robust principal components with this DMD, uh, the robust principal components uh, is, a, is actually an L1 optimization, which requires an SVD at every step. So its convergence to the solution is extremely slow, whereas the DMD requires one singular value decomposition. And in fact, if you look at the timing as a performance as a number of frames, or number of pixels per frame goes up, or as a number of frames in each uh, segment goes up, so in other words, the number of frames I keep per segment, goes up, what you find consistently across the board is that if you do this dynamic mode decomposition separation, it's two, three, four orders of magnitude faster than robust principal components. And this is the one I'm referring to here, which is from Kendez, Lima, and Wright, um, which is a more standard way to do robust PCA. And in fact, one viewpoint of this DMD architecture and background foreground subtraction is that this allows you to do robust principal component analysis, which is something of growing importance in a lot of areas. So this is just one simple objective, which is to pull around foreground from background. What we'd like to do is pull apart time scales, fast scales from slow scales, not just simply stationary versus non-stationary. And so we start taking this interpretation of a wavelet-like decomposition. In particular, if we look at these four pictures, what we normally think of as a time series analysis is here, which is I have some resolution in time and of, of my information and my data. And if I use a time series, I have no frequency content. So I don't know what the frequencies are, but I have nice resolution in time. I could alternatively uh, Fourier transform the signals. So I get some time. I have no longer any time information, but I now have frequency content. So I could take signals, terminant frequencies, but I don't know when they happened in time. And of course, it's been known for a long time, you could sort of trade off some of the accuracy in time or frequency for each other and build something like a histogram. Uh, I mean, sorry, a spectrogram where you have frequency and time and a little bit of information in each, and you have these nice bins of information. Now, where wavelets comes in is this uh, different way of start thinking about breaking up time and frequency, which is you can take a large window of sampling and look for slow modes in there, pull those out. Now look for smaller windows, pull out the slow wind frequencies there, pull those out, and you just do this in a hierarchical way, and you recursively refine uh, your time and frequency content. And it gives you a chart something like this. So at the lowest level of the decomposition, you get the low frequencies, and they live over a big time window. And then as you cut this down in half, you start getting uh, finer resolution in time as you go up this thing, but less resolution in frequency. Okay, So this is a fairly standard picture uh, from a wavelet type decompositional multi-resolution analysis that you would see in wavelet theory. Now what we want to do is take that and use this here, which is to say, I have some snapshots of a dynamical system, whether it's a fluid flow, or looking at a large grouping of neurons in time uh, or video frames. Uh, and I, what I can do is take snapshots of the, of the dynamics given by here. And normally what we do is just do the decomposition here. But now what I can do is look at those snapshots, take out only the slowest frequency. So if I look at the, the frequency content here, any modes that sit near enough to zero, I will consider those slow modes. And I can take them out at that level of the decomposition. And now they no longer pollute my signal. So I fill this up. It's much more like a wavelet decomposition. 
Now what I do is take my sampling window, cut it in half, and I look for two regions, and in each region I look for the slow modes now of this window. Okay, so that's the blue here. And I look again for eigenvalues now in this region. And what ends up happening, the eigenvalues on the outside, every time I cut it in half, move towards the origin. Okay, so the eigenvalues here in blue now move into my mode removal region. And then when I cut it in half again, the modes from the outside fall back into the mode removal region. So this is the one way to start thinking about this, which is you recursively refine your sampling window. And this is the picture here, which is uh, effectively like the wavelet picture, but now we're doing it from dynamical systems perspective. So at each level, you pull these things out, and you can, you can get this information. Uh, so it looks something like this. When you do this multi-resolution analysis, you look at your solution, the DMD sol solution, and what you simply do is sit, normally you say just sum up all the modes, but now you start thinking, well, wait a minute, which ones are the slow modes, which ones are the fast modes? Now I get to define what I mean by slow, which is some region uh, near, some threshold under which if it's slow enough, I'll take out at that level. And typically if you take a window, you want just the slow modes that fit here, but don't necessarily fit here, okay? So it defines for you a very simply a way to, principal way to take out the modes. Now once you've done this, now you can collect the slow modes and then you can come back over and say, now I'm going to cut my window into two pieces. Okay, take your full window, first piece, second piece. Now you continue this recursive refinement. And then so you have level one decomposition, level two decomposition, level three, and so forth. Okay? Uh, here's the picture uh, that you might want to think, consider, which is exactly what we had before. And at each level, we're going to indicate how we pull out modes by this psi of k l j. In fact, the principled way to do this is that you're going to need three indices. You're going to need l, which is going to be the number of decomposition levels you use, j, which is the number of bins at each level. So for instance, in the first level, there's one bin. Second level, there's two bins. Third level, there's three bins, eight bins, and so forth. And then k, which is the number of modes you keep at each level. So for instance, you might find only one mode in the slow, one slow mode at the leading level, which would be a background, and you might not find any modes at certain levels, but K is the way you parameterize this. Okay? So that's the picture of this breakdown, and every mode is parameterized by these three uh, indices or integers. So a more formal multi-resolution expansion uh, is going to be constructed in the following way. So first of all, we define a time sifting function, FLJ, parameterized by the level and the bin I'm in, and it's one if you're in an interval TJ to TJ plus one, and zero elsewhere. In other words, this is a sifting function. So it tells you when this thing is on and which, which one of those bins and levels you are on, okay? Um, so by defining this function f, we can actually construct formally the expansion in the following way. You have your, you have your uh, index, index, uh, time, uh, time sifting operation here, your coefficients, your modes, and then your time dynamics. Another way to view this is that at each level and each bin, you actually are pulling out some linear dynamical system that best characterizes the data of that system. Okay? Now, uh, I haven't made any, uh, anything fancy here with the f. It's just simply ones or zeros. But this is an interesting place to start working because right here, you could imagine all the different kind of wavelets that have been applied to different problems can be imposed right here. Instead of just a simp simple one or zero indicator function, I could make, for instance, a Haar wavelet basis or Mexican hat wavelets, adobe shees. There's different kinds of opportunities here for applying that to the problem and getting potentially, depending upon your data, uh, a better characterization of your multi-resolution data. Okay? We've only done the simple thing. You'll see it's very effective in the examples that follow. So let me show you an example. And this is a toy video where I'm going to put together four modes. Here's a background mode. Here's a foreground object or a moving object. It's a, just a little dot that's going to oscillate in time like this. And then I have this mode here which is going to be on for a little while in time and then turn off. And then the fourth mode is this one here. It's two points, which is, 
it's off, and then it turns on for a little while and turns off. And what I'm comparing it to is the multi-resolution DMD analysis as well as the dynamic mode decomposition analysis that you would get if you just took the whole interval. So both of them produce pretty accurate uh, predictions of what the mode should look like. If you could see here a little bit the residual between this mode and this mode here, the true mode, and this mode here, which is DMD approximation, this here would give you the residual, and you'll see a little residual because it doesn't get it exactly right, whereas the multi-res DMD gets it pretty much perfect. What's more striking is in the temporal dynamics, if you look at the, multi, the true mode is the cyan dots, the multi-res is white, and the DMD is yellow. And you can see they get this mode background completely perfectly. Same thing with this slowly moving mode, but it's when things turn on and off. In other words, transient phenomena, the dynamic mode decomposition really fails here, whereas the multi-res captures it perfectly. So for instance here, you can see the yellow is off. It tries to put things here when in fact the solution is off. Same thing here, the dynamic mode decomposition has this decaying yellow when in fact it should be off, whereas the multi-res gets everything right. It captures the on-off structures perfectly. It captures transients, and in fact, with the recursive refinement of the window, this is part of why it does so well. And if you were to look, you can also look at this decomposition from that original picture of the multi-res uh, decomposition, which is here are the modes at level one, level two in the first window, level two in the second window, level three at the different windows. And it gives you exactly the mode structure for that toy example. Now, of course, that toy example uh, was manufactured. It's very simple. Uh, we can apply this to more sophisticated data sets. In fact, the one I want to apply it to here is El Nino data from 1990s to 2010, which is freely downloadable off a NOAA website. And what we did is a, just simply applied this principled approach, multi-res, to this whole data set where it would recursively refine. And what you find out of the data is some very interesting features. At the first level of the analysis, the mode that pops out, the dominant mode there, is in fact the mean temperature mode across the entire ocean. This is uh, ocean temperature data, again, for a 20-year span. And what we'd like to do now is recursively refine this. So this is, in fact, a mode uh, with period infinity. In other words, a background stationary mode. Here is a mode with approximately a yearly cycle. That's also we can take out at this level. And as you advance in levels, what's very interesting is at level four, you can find in 1997 this mode right here. It just comes out, pops out for you. Here's a mode that has a lot of energy, and this is your El Nino mode. If you look right here, right off the coast of Peru, you see that large warm spot body of water. Okay? Whereas 1999, it does not appear there. In fact, 1997 was known to be, be a very strong El Nino year. In fact, we can look at this mode more carefully. Uh, and there it is. You can see there the, 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 the characteristic feature of the El Nino uh, mode sitting right there. And again, this was from a very principled point of view. We didn't uh, tell it it was there. We just let this thing recursively refine, find this mode. It gave a very strong signature at that year, and we can pull it out, and you can do the analysis there. Of course, if you already knew it was there, you knew what to look for. But the nice thing about this multi-res DMD is even if I didn't know what to look for, it would have gotten me this mode uh, and told me that this was an important mode with lots of energy content in this year. And then you could back out what this uh, would be. So, uh, so Gilbert Walker would certainly have appreciated this technique uh, in looking for this uh, ENSO phenomena. So that's a second example. And now let me give you uh, one more example. And this example really is, I think, one of the most important because it addresses the Achilles heel of SVD-based methods, translating or rotating uh, phenomena in, 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 uh, in spatial temporal uh, uh, data collection. So what we know is that if you have even a simple traveling wave, if you do an SVD on it, it looks like it's very high dimensional, and lots of modes are active, when we know it's actually two modes one that happens to be with translation. Now what this does in a principled way is I can take the following example, which is one mode here that's moving up with speed v, this mode here which is moving across with 
speed 10b. So a fast object and a slow object. And my video is the combination of these two. And what I do is I start this process going, and anything that's moving really fairly rapidly on the big uh, snapshot window will simply be ignored because it'll look high dimensional, it will look like it's producing nothing near the zero frequency. But for instance, at level two, at level two, this is when it's going to capture the slow mode. In other words, at level two in the analysis, when these smaller windows, it's almost as if that mode looks like it's going slow enough to give you to be in your mode removal region. And so you can pull out mode, that mode right here at level two of the analysis. So the slow mode comes out very nicely. And in fact, because it's level two, you can also back out the speed. And then as you continue this process all the way to level 13, it captures as a very fast mode with very fast translation. And you can see it here. There's the strong signature of the mode. It does have a residual from the slow mode as well as sort of a, a shadow of where it's traversing. However, it does give you a very clear, strong signal at where the mode peak is actually supposed to be. So uh, not perfect, but uh, None of these methods, none of the SVD methods actually handle invariances very well. And this one here does it in a, in a pretty good way without any kind of uh, uh, supervised learning. Moreover, you can sort of think about an iterative architecture to refine these results. So once you've seen it in this window, you can redo this SVD on that window. And there's some work on that with, from the Grosek Kutz paper uh, about how to improve these results. So all these things suggest that it can be a very effective tool uh, that is uh, unsupervised in some sense. You just give it the data set. It will recursively look out for you for the dominant features and structures in time space. And there's a lot of innovations now uh, that make it even more attractive. And I'm going to point out a couple of them. You can start thinking about a couple things. <coughs> One is using compressive strategies. In other words, use some ideas from sparsity and compressive sensing so that you can take a smaller number of measurements and still reconstruct this future state estimates of the system, as well as using ideas of control theory and recasting the whole dynamic mode decomposition with a control variable so that you can disambiguate between what is control and what is input. And this is work with Steve Brutton and Josh Proctor. And these are, this hasn't been, these ideas have not been applied to the multi-resolution uh, DMD. However, they have a very natural framework for integrating compression and the control architectures on the multi-res uh, structure that's uh, given here. Um, and I think that certainly that's future work and very important, especially in things like ocean data where you only have a limited mem uh, number of measurements. It's also important in most applications when you're actually at, very interested in reconstructing this linear dynamical system so you could do control on it. Uh, in addition to those, there's a number of other interesting architectures that have been, are being worked out now in the community. There's a lot of machine learning and uh, ideas afloat and basic ideas to use library learning, encode your low dimensional patterns of activity into a library so that you can call on them quickly. In other words, a lot of the dynamic activity you might see would repeat itself down the road in, if you're in the same dynamical regime. The cost of doing the SVD could be very large, but if you basically save these results, uh, you can make use of them later at, at a fraction of the cost. There's also kernel-based methods, which are quite nice in terms of trying to uh, basically uh, make the, the dy dynamic mode decomposition handle nonlinear systems or more, uh, better handle nonlinear dynamics. Um, noise reduction is, is incredibly important. And how, to ha how do you handle noisy data? Uh, there are some recent results by Dawson, Hamadi, Williams, and Rowley that really highlight some uh, novel methods for denoising of your data stream before applying uh, some of these methodologies, and also some very nice and uh, timely connections to Koopman analysis where you can figure out how to deform some of these substructures uh, or these linear embedding spaces so that your linear results more cl closely match the nonlinear results of the, of the true system. Uh, all these in combination can be used for things like building things like self-tuning lasers. Suppose I have a laser system and I don't know the dynamics 
in this laser system, or perhaps my dynamical equations I have are not accurate enough to give me uh, a control authority. Here, the idea is to use some of these dynamic mode decomposition techniques because it is an equation-free architecture. It allows me to say, I don't know this exactly, but I can basically reconstruct this linear system, which allows me for some control protocols to be enacted. And a more interesting area, too, is uh, I think very rich with multi-scale dynamics is in neuroscience, uh, where you can take something like ECOG readings and you can apply dynamic mode decomposition there. This is some recent work with Bing Brunton where recording from uh, ECOG on scalp, inter intracranial, uh, gives you some very nice signatures. Here they were, uh, the work was looking at sleep spindles and the dynamic mode decomposition captures these beautifully. And there, there was an expert in the loop step, which is you knew the windows and the frequencies to look around. And what the multi-res allows you to potentially do is to simply go into the system look at that data and pull out features at different levels without having the expert in the loop knowledge. You might find some very interesting features there that you don't know about, but actually are, are certainly in the data. So conclusions, um, the DMD, multi-res, it's a fast, certainly originally fast and uh, algorithm for background foreground separation. And it has this much more general framework in terms of multiple scale time scales, physics, okay? And so this is a very nice architecture that we've now generalized the method to uh, to capture a, a variety of phenomena in your data. Uh, it's very nice because it can be integrated with sparsity, compressive sensing, and control architectures. And of course, all of those things have very broad applicability. Any kind of very high dimensional data set, multi-scale, you might want to apply something like this when you do not feel that you have, in fact, the right set of equations. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that it also could benefit from some kind of incremental SVD computation as you start measuring in time and you're doing this SVD, you might want to do low rank updates to the SVD and that's all part of a future uh, research agenda. Thank you for tuning into this Lightboard presentation, uh, this video abstract on, on the multi-resolution dynamic mode decomposition.